I'm speaking on cultural heritage and the denial of genocide law. Genocide, as we've seen throughout this conference, is a cultural crime. In the historically contested case of the Armenian genocide, this observation permits us to confront the three challenges I address in my presentation today. The limits of genocide law, the significance of cultural heritage in genocidal perpetration, and the crisis of reconciliation in the face of official denial. When Raphael Lemkin first began to conceive of a law criminalizing what he later termed genocide, culture was at the forefront of his thoughts. In 1933, he proposed a set of five offenses, which he considered instrumental def to defining, quote, acts of extermination directed against ethnic, religious, or social collectivities, whatever the motive. He identified the first two of these offenses as acts of barbarity and acts of vandalism. Acts of barbarity he described as an attack intended not only to harm an individual, but also to cause damage to the collectivity to which the leader belongs. And he described vandalism as an extension of such violence, defining it as a form of systematic and organized destruction of the art and cultural heritage in which the unique genius and achievement of a collectivity are revealed in fields of science, arts, and literature. Lemkin thus identified the genocidaire as both barbarian and vandal. By the time the UN Genocide Convention was finalized, however, acts of barbarity was subsumed into the definition of his neologism genocide, whereas acts of vandalism was altogether excluded. The reasons for this exclusion, as numerous scholars, such as William Shabbos, for example, have observed, were exclusively political, motivated entirely by certain UN member states, most notably France and the US, concerns over self-incrimination. The vandalism or cultural destruction clause did not appear in the final UN Genocide Convention and to date still remains merely a conceptual framework outside of the treaty's legislative purview. I would argue that this deliberate omission renders the laws on genocide in significant part as laws of denial, that the very legal foundations criminalizing the act are constitutively encoded to preemptively deny its perpetration. Such abjurative legislation is evident in the United States' aggressive tactics to ensure this clause's excision. The US was, in fact, the only UN ad hoc committee member to oppose inclusion of a ban on cultural genocide. Barry Saltman explains that while, on the one hand, quote, it, the US, argued that matters covered by the article should be dealt with elsewhere and in connection with protection of minority rights, the US, at the same time, quote, opposed the UDHR, as in Universal Declaration of Human Rights, minority rights provision. In fact, employing Eleanor Roosevelt, of all people, as its delegate, the US explicitly acted in interpretive denial when it, quote, asserted that it had no minorities and insisted that minority rights be excluded from the UDHR because there were no minority problems anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. It then misrepresented the degree of support for the article by other member states in order to defeat it in a committee maneuver, end quote. Cultural genocide, then, in its juridical absence, constitutes the trace of the past, present, and future of genocide denial. And the UNGC, as the enactment of its official exclusion, arguably sanctions that denial. The material and historical conditions of Ottoman Armenian cultural remains in Turkey poignantly instantiate this exclusion's ramifications and stakes. It is impossible to discuss the Armenian genocide without acknowledging cultural destruction's instrumentality in the Ottoman government's annihilationist designs, and it would not be exaggeration to suggest that the same government's definitionally and juridically incriminating intent to enact genocide is signally substantiated by its and its Turkish Republican heirs' vandalization of Ottoman Armenian cultural sites. I would ask you to recall Ida's statements yesterday um, about the continuity of the genocide in contemporary Turkey. Of course, such acts of vandalism must be contextualized. We need to consider them within broader discussions, elaborating the political economy of late Ottoman genocidal violence. A growing number of scholars, most notably Ur Imit Inger, one of our distinguished guests, and Mehmet Politel, have explored the economic and legal motivations and bases which both facilitated the genocide and lay the foundations of its anticipated denial. New research in this area details the manner in which Armenian capital as liquid assets, and also in the form of movable and immovable properties, was confisc confiscated and appropriated through extensive planning and implementation. These important findings show that such properties were instrumentalized to satisfy various economic and demographic needs, demonstrating ex post facto practical outcomes. But it is arguably in the violent acts of cultural destruction themselves 
that the genocidal intent to purge the Armenian presence is most illustrative. An intent that, as Taner Akçam demonstrates, became normalized in the spirit of the subsequent Turkish Republican legal structure in order to ensure that, quote, even if the Armenians survived, nothing would be returned to them and all traces of them and their existence would be erased, end quote. The most vivid illustration of such erasure was ostensibly the treatment of centuries old religious structures, such as the Cis Catholicus compound seen here. It no longer exists. It's been raised to the ground. Levon Nordigian, in a volume called Les Armeniens de Cilici, does a marvelous job reconstructing um, the compound visually. According to the 1913 14 archives of the Armenian Patriarchate of Istanbul, Armenian religious structures total 2,538 churches and 451 monasteries before the First World War. At least one account claims that with the onset of the massacres in 1915 and lasting until 1923, around 1,000 Armenian churches and monasteries were leveled to the ground and 700 other religious constructs were half destroyed through willful destruction by fire or explosives. Such demolition by force qualitatively differs from other methods of defacement, such as many other sites, conversions into mosques, museums, prisons, sporting centers, granaries, stables, and farms. It may be possible to explain away the latter instances as erstwhile necessities in the war effort or as a result of abandonment by Armenian constituencies. The history of the other structures violent raising, however, dramatizes instead a historically conscious and future-oriented will to annihilate, one that has come to fruition during the Turkish Republican era. Religious structures, Ottoman era conversions and ruins are and have been common knowledge to Armenians for a century. But in the last decade, this knowledge has mobilized efforts for pursuing inroads toward reparative justice and even reconciliation through attempts at reclaiming and restoring destroyed properties. The return to these ruins afterlives is grounded in Turkey's shifting political culture with the Justice and Development Party's seeming cultural inclusiveness and Turkish civil society's increasingly public confrontations with official narratives of Turkish homogeneity and exclusivity which, as Hernar Watempa observes, are, quote, often articulated through cultural heritage. Meanwhile, Armenian constituents, especially in the United States, have brought unprecedented visibility to Ottoman Armenian sites of ruin through what has since the 1990s developed into a kind of return to Yergir or return to the country movement spurred by mushrooming pilgrimage tourism and its discursive reverberations throughout reportages, testimonials, travelogues, films, and memoirs. And most importantly, renovations at three sites, various structures in Ani, the Church of the Holy Cross, Subhachin Akhtamar, and the Saint or Surp Giragos Church in Diyarbakir have become nodes of socio-political discussion and activity around especially questions of reparative justice and reconciliation. To that end, Hernar Watempa's comprehensive account of Ani's restorations claims that the coincidence of, quote, the official Ministry of Culture and Tourism restoration and the public debate about non-Muslims in the late Ottoman Empire has positioned Ani at the center of dialogue about the ambiguities of preservation and the politics of cultural memory in contemporary Turkey. Ani's history of ruination differs in complexity from Holy Cross and Surkiragos, having become the capital of the medieval Armenian kingdom in the 10th and 11th centuries of the Common Era. The city's decline and desolation followed from the Mongol invasions, earthquake, and changing trade routes long before the Ottomans and the First World War. Turkey's policy of erasure regarding its Armenian history, however, as well as the irregularities surrounding its structure's renovations, draw the area into the orbit of cultural destruction and genocide denial. Watempa discusses Ani's significance precisely within this context, identifying the numerous stakeholders invested culturally, politically, economically, and academically in the site's renovations. And she concludes by raising the possibility of treating cultural heritage as the basis for, quote, projects for justice, truth, and reconciliation, with Ani as the potential prototype for turning contested cultural heritage into an opportunity for, quote, encounter, dialogue, reflection, and perhaps even reconciliation. That is, with the proviso that the difficult issues at Ani should be admitted and, quote, contests over the site's meaning should be acknowledged rather than ignored and engaged rather than silenced. Watempa leaves the precise identities of these agents of encounter, dialogue, reflection, and reconciliation unclear, though it is safe to assume that the forms of admission and acknowledgement she considers a prerequisite entail the Turkish state's official recognition of its genocidal history. <laughs> 
Given the absence of further specifications, one might argue that based on Wattenpah's own stated findings, in this article, encounter, dialogue, reflection, and certain kinds of reconciliation are and have been well underway among individuals, as well as organizations, invested in excavating and preserving Ani's multidimensional heritage. Among these, she names the Armenian-Turkish Stonemasonry Cooperation Program. She identifies certain academics who have suggested that Armenian experts should be involved in Ani's preservation. And she also notes the role that Ani plays as a catalyst for dialogue and reconciliation in the Armenia-Turkey project, Ani as a, as a cultural bridge between Armenia and Turkey, which is led by the Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation based here in The Hague. Yet having enumerated these exemplary instances, Wattenpah insists on their insufficiency given the, quote, disconnection between the iconic status of Ani as a symbol of collaboration and reconciliation and the actual treatment of the site where any activity on the ground is subject to MCT policies. A significant ambivalence of recognition thus pervades Wattenpah's discussion on the possibility of employing cultural heritage as a nexus for reconciliation. It seems at first to be indicative of official Turkish genocide denial, which despite scattered civil society initiatives, prevents any lasting actionable solutions to halting Armenian cultural destruction in Turkey. But I would suggest that this ambivalence arises from the very idea of reconciliation, which Wattenpah and many others never attempt to define. What does it mean to reconcile in this case? Who might the initiators, arbiters, and beneficiaries of such reconciliation be? Is reconciliation a question of rhetorical admission, or does it require some official legal or economic settlement? It is entirely possible in Turkey today for former Armenian proprietors, such as the Armenian Patriarch in Istanbul, to legally and successfully reclaim their confiscated properties. Do such successful reclamations count as reconciliation? Does it automatically follow that if Turkey admits to a genocidal past, Armenian heritage sites will no longer be subject to ruin and may even be restored? If so, based on which legal provisions? In its own defense, if unconvincing, Turkey can cite recent legal amendments to ensure non-Muslim foundation properties return to their rightful owners, that is, if claimed during the mandated 1936 declaration and with various practical limitations. Could this initiative be deemed an act of reconciliation? Before assaying responses to these queries, let us recall that cultural destruction does not legally qualify as an act of genocide. It is this fundamental juridical denial encoded within the U UNGC that prompts the irreconcilable ambivalence in Wattenpah's proposal. For had such a law existed, or had subsequent amendments introduced by representatives of indigenous groups been incorporated, it might have been possible to pursue genocide reconciliation with the Turkish state through legal settlement on the preservation or at least non-destruction of Armenian heritage sites. It might have been possible to imagine the remaining Armenian community in Turkey as plaintiffs launching proceedings against the state for expressly endangering their socio-cultural existence through their material heritage's systematic erasure. And the genocidal intent, if not of the CUP, then of the Turkish Republic, could have certainly been put on trial. The calculated exclusion of a cultural destruction clause in the UNGC prevents the identification of cultural heritage as a site of genocidal intent. And by logical as well as juridical inference, it renders calls for reconciliation predicated upon state recognition of cultural destruction untenable. That is not to say that such acts of destruction cannot be recognized under other legal texts and prosecuted for reparations accordingly. Susan Karamanyan spoke yesterday on employing contract and property law as viable legal options for those seeking restitution. But the larger issue here is how cultural destru destruction functions as a form of systematic persecution against minority nationals amounting to a crime against humanity. And it is an issue that when arising from non-conflict contexts, presents considerable challenges in claims for restitution made to international courts. Joseph Fishman sheds light on this challenge by explaining that international law on such injuries relates primarily to property belonging to alien nationals, such that sovereign states' decisions, quote, regarding their own nationals' property have remained essentially internal affairs. As a result, if aliens are not involved, there is normally nothing short of a treaty obligation to internationalize the state's decisions, end quote. Fishman details, moreover, existing law state-centric approach, 
and explains that even though various rulings and declarations are allowing non-state actors to emerge as rights holders in cultural property on the international stage, they amount to, quote, a non-binding commitment that does not independently form the basis of a legal obligation, end quote. The same conclusion that Fishman draws may be drawn about the recently issued Turkey Christian Church's Accountability Act, known as H.R. 4347. The act, strongly supported by Armenian American interest groups, was passed by the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee in June 2014. Much as the 2003 UNESCO declaration, H.R. 4347 may be seen in Fishman's words as, at best, purely hortatory, and at worst, suggestive that, quote, the main preoccupation is to preserve domestic interests rather than to produce an instrument having the effective scope of safeguarding a value belonging to the international community as a whole. In that respect, H.R. 4347 also instantiates the tenuousness of citing cultural destruction as a genocidal crime. This act directs the Sec Secretary of State to report annually to Congress in 2021 on the status of, on the status and return of stolen, confiscated, or otherwise unreturned Christian churches, places of worship, and other properties in or from the Republic of Turkey and in the areas of Northern Cyprus occupied by the Turkish military. It also requires that a summary of such information be included in the annual country reports on human rights practices and the international religious freedom reports. These requirements and their justification are couched in the language of religious freedom and with reference to the US government's diplomatic commitment to safeguarding and promoting religious freedom abroad. But several of its findings, specifically 6, 10, and 13, read together as core aspects of the bill's stipulated rationale intimate the idiom of genocide by cultural destruction though neither H.R. 4347 nor its precursor, H.R. 306, introduced in 2011, ever employ the term genocide. These findings condemn Turkey for preventing rightful Christian church authorities from safeguarding, repairing, or otherwise caring for their holy sites upon their ancient homelands because the properties have facilities or museums or are subjected to deliberate neglect. They claim that these ancient territories, that is Anatolia, were for thousands of years home to a large indigenous Christian population, but because of years of repressive Turkish government policies, historic atrocities, and brutal persecution, today Christians constitute less than 1% of Turkey's population. And they cite the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, which in 2012 reported that the Turkish government's long-standing policies continue to threaten the survivability and viability of minority religious communities in Turkey. These findings bear a strong resemblance to the excised Article 3 of the UN Ad Hoc Genocide Committee's initial 1946 draft, which defied, defined as genocidal any deliberate act committed with the intent to destroy the language, religion, or culture of a national, racial, or religious group on grounds of national or racial origin or religious belief, such as destroying or preventing the use of libraries, museums, schools, historical monuments, places of worship, or other cultural institutions and objects of the group. H.R. 4347's elusive and ambiguous phrasing, especially as evinced in such wording as repressive policies, historic atrocities, and brutal persecution, exhibits the same kind of abjurative legislation, which through the UNGC has legally obstructed the prosecution of cultural destruction as a genocidal crime. In so doing, this bill establishes, moreover, a legislative platform for promoting reconciliation without recognition insofar as reconciliation denotes the purification or reconsecration of a desecrated church or holy place and the action or an act of bringing a thing or things to agreement, concord, or harmony. Countering both Watempa's requirement for recognition toward reconciliation and H.R. 4347's tacitly mandated reconciliation without recognition is a phenomenon consisting of both state and civil society actors engaging in and promoting recognition cum reconciliation. This phenomenon revolves around the recently renovated Church of Sukiragos in Diyarbakir, which Watempao herself notes and designates as an inclusive production of, quote, counter heritage. Yet despite the local governments, that is the Diyarbakir municipality's direct involvement in the restoration, she considers it a non-government initiative. One can easily argue that Sukiragos' renovation was in significant part a government initiative given the direct involvement of and funding by the local municipal council, and especially of such political actors as Abdullah Demir Bash, Demir Bash, mayor of Sur, and Osman Bay Demir, mayor of Greater Diyarbakir, though certainly not representative of the entire Turkish government, 
The developments in Diyarbakir, be they Surk Giragos's restoration, Armenian-centered cultural events and language classes at the site, the reconversions of Islamized, Ar Islamized Armenians to Christianity through baptisms held at the church, or public acknowledgments and commemorations of the Armenian genocide by local officials and residents. The regional government's commitment to, re to resuscitate Armenian heritage in the region constitutes recognition and reconciliation at the levels of both state and civil society. It is a potentially replicable phenomenon, as evidenced in the case of Bitlis, where following Surkiragos's reconstruction, certain municipal officials have expressed interest in reintroducing Armenian heritage by renovating the district's remaining Armenian church, and where they have also now succeeded in renaming a street after William Saroyan. Beyond sweeping and hitherto unrealizable recommendations of Armenian-Turkish reconciliation, from establishing an independent historical commission to joint bilateral policy making by the governments of Armenia and Turkey, beyond the potential for co-optation by state interests a la Ani and Holy Cross, and independent of the UNGC's abjurative legislation, in short, beyond the law of genocide and its denialist consequences, Localized ventures of cultural reconstruction have and may continue to provide the most consequential forms, not only of recognition and reconciliation, but more importantly, of revitalization and liberation. Thank you very much.